Welcome to the Sciatica Savior Workshop. I'm Braden Kipp, Registered Physical Therapist at East Hill Physiotherapy. And tonight, I'm going to be your guide to saving yourself from sciatica. So I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody who came on Wednesday for the, uh, the workshop. We did have some technical difficulties uh, with some sound and that kind of stuff. So we decided um, we might refilm this so uh, everybody who wants the content can uh, visualize it and get everything they need from it. So I'm excited to have you all joining tonight for this virtual workshop. And I hope that each one of you will find out what is causing or has caused your sciatica and how to correct it. So you're going to learn sciatica doesn't have to be a pain in your butt. So come learn how to fix your sciatica for good. All attendees are going to get their names put into a random draw for a free East Hill Physio session. I mean, who doesn't want to win this prize? And you're going to want to stick around until the very end of the workshop because at the end, we're going to spin the wheel to see who the lucky winner of the live giveaway is. If you're interested in winning, let's try out the chat box. Remember, it's in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Type win in the chat box if you want to win the giveaway. So tonight you can look forward to discovering what causes sciatica, learn how to diagnose your sciatic pain, how you can resolve your sciatica with non-operative techniques, what you should avoid when your sciatica is flared up, and how to prevent your sciatica from reoccurring and how to protect your back. So sciatica doesn't have to be a pain in your butt. So I want to do a poll with you guys. So there's a little rec uh, triangular symbol down in the right-hand corner. Um, so I want to know, what are you hoping to learn about sciatica? Type, uh, go on the poll. So, so what are you hoping to learn? A, how long it will take to go away. B, what is causing it. C, exercise to do get rid of it and prevent it. Or E, all of the above. Usually with sciatica, it's around a four to eight week uh, period for your pain to go away and your movement and strength to return plus another one to four months depending on your activities that you have to get back to so if you're somebody that is very physical and has to do a lot of labor it might take a little longer question two how do you know if your sciatica is getting better a symptoms moving out of the leg and strength returning b more numbness and tingling in the leg or c the sciatica moves from one leg to both? Or D, bending forward or twisting feels better? What do you guys think? D is actually a trick question. Although some pathologies, forward bending feels better and helps it, it's not always the case for everything that causes sciatica. And then the third question, can I become completely healed or will this come back again? A, it's likely to come back. B, completely healed, no issues. C, come and go. Or D, all of the above. Yeah, you guys are right, it's D. Um, so sciatica can come and go, and that's kind of what we want to try to prevent. So the stronger the person is, the less likely the symptoms will come back. Your body's a bit like a car. If you take care of it, regularly change the oil and keep it running and fine-tuned, there's little chance of breakdown. If you ignore it, very likely to break down and be in need of repair. So what causes sciatica? So basically what happens is when the sciatic nerve becomes pinched, and then it can cause radiating pain from the lumbar spine to the buttock and down the leg following the nerve pathway. So usually it'll fall the, the back of the thigh and the calf. Usually with sciatica, it only affects one side of the body and causes inflammation, pain, numbness. And then with severe symptoms, you can get significant leg weakness. Legs might feel like they're giving way, or you can actually have bowel or bladder changes. So if you're having bladder or bowel changes, it would be a good opportunity for you to have a visit with your doc and just check in. Um, and also this can feel like a mild ache and it can get a severe sharp burning sensation like an electric shock or electric jolt down your legs. So it's not just the sciatic nerve that gets impinged, it can be uh, the nerve roots in the lower back. Anything that connects to the sciatic nerve can impinge there, which can cause it to radiate along the pathway. So true or false, sciatica is a condition and a diagnosis. The answer, false. It's really a symptom 
not a diagnosis. It's a symptom indicating that something is irritating the nerve root in the lower back. So the important thing is to decipher what is causing the pressure on the nerve. And the next few slides are going to help you determine what is causing that nerve compression. So the five most common causes of sciatica, what I usually see, number one, disc degenerative disease, DDD. Number two, disc herniation. Three is spinal stenosis. Four, spondylolisthesis. Five, piriformis syndrome. So number one, disc degenerative disease. So in this condition, there's a loss of disc height. So you can see above, there's a healthy disc. It's nice and thick, full of fluid. And below it, there's a degenerative disc. It's lost some height. There's less space for that nerve to come out of. So then you can see also in that degenerative disc, there's osteophyte formation. So with a little bit of grinding, wear and tear, the bones become uh, like spurred. Uh, and then the disc, they don't absorb as much water anymore. So your shock absorber, like in your car, doesn't work as much. So you get more wear and tear. So it's really common in those over 60 years old. You'll often notice pain with lifting heavy objects. And it's really common, and the dead giveaway to know is you have morning stiffness and soreness, which actually improves as you get moving. I, one of my favorite things, you guys might have heard me say it before, is motion is lotion. Um, so as you get moving in that first 30 minutes or an hour in your morning, it'll get better. This is likely the cause. Number two is disc herniation. So usually about... 95% of the time, it happens at the L4-5, L5-S1 segment, which is right at your very low back, right before your tailbone, right down low. Um, so yeah, this is the most common region. It can be degenerative, occurring with age and wear and tear. Usually what happens is it occurs from like spinal overload when, you're when your back and your spine aren't ready or can't handle those forces. So it's really common in those a little younger, 30s to 50s. So I want to show you guys a, a good test for a self-diagnosis that you can try at home. So you can follow along. You can try this with me. So there's two you can try. So the first one's called a straight leg raise, and the other one's called a slump. So let me take you through these. So what you want to do for your slump test is you want to find somewhere comfy where you can sit. And then what you want to do is, this is the first time you'll, and only time you'll hear me say bad posture is okay. You want to slump over, bring your chin down to your chest. And then you want to extend your foot all the way out. If you feel that reproduces your pain or your numbness, tingling, or your symptoms in your leg, likely you have a disc injury, okay? If you lift your head up and it gets better, that's indicated that, yes, that's a disc injury. If you bend over, it gets worse, disc injury. The other way you could try this is if you lay onto your back. You can get somebody to help you or you can lift your leg up. Same thing, if you get some radiating symptoms or it reproduces your sciatic pain, you can bias it, you can bring your chin up if that makes it worse, likely that's a disc or neuro involvement. You bring it back down, it goes away. It's a positive sign that there's some disc involvement. <laughs> Everyone always likes to ask me about uh, if x-rays or MRIs are necessary. And a lot of times I say no. Um, we can find that out a lot of times without having to put you through radiation. Usually 20 to 30% of disc bulges are actually asymptomatic. So you might not even know you have them, to be honest. Number three is spinal stenosis. So what happens in spinal stenosis is there's narrowing of the spinal canal or intervertebral foramina. So where that nerve root comes out, there's actually less space and it gets pinched on more. So my analogy is always the train that comes through the tunnel. The tunnel is nice and wide. The train can make it through the tunnel easily. If that tunnel squeezed down, the train gets stuck. There's not as much room for it to go through the tunnel. So again, you might have some changes in bladder, bowel symptoms. You get some pain and weakness in your lower extremities. So the dead giveaway for spinal stenosis, guys, something that really helps is if you bend forward, if you're doing anything into this flexed position, it actually creates space and opens up that area for the nerve to breathe. So if you find better sitting flexed positions, likely have some spinal stenosis versus if you do these extended positions, it actually pinches down on it, creates less space. 
So if that makes it worse, then likely there's some stenosis happening. Usually it affects those most commonly in the years 50 to 60. Uh, again, it's the L4-5, uh, uh, L5-S1 nerve roots that are affected segments. Um, usually low back pain with this one is alleviated by rest. It can be unilateral, meaning it goes down one leg, but a lot of times it's bilateral. So this is the difference, okay? So compared to DDD, which walking, standing, actually makes it, um, actually makes stenosis worse, whereas in DDD, we said movement is good, it feels better, okay? Um, and then compared to a disc herniation or a disc bulge, flexion feels better, that flex position, whereas with a disc, extension will feel better, flexion will feel worse. So kind of keep that in mind when you're trying to self-diagnose, okay? So you can always, with this, you can get some paresthesia, you can get weakness, fatigue. Symptoms are going to radiate from your upper body and your back down into your leg. Um, usually gets worse with standing, with walking, as we suggested, and then better with sitting, with flex position. Um, so with this, there's a nice test you can try with this to try to diagnose yourself with some spinal stenosis. Besides the flexion extension kind of things that we were talking about, what you can try, it's called a single leg standing test. So you guys can follow along and you can try this at home with me. So all you want to do is you want to try to keep your hips level. And I want you to try to stand on one leg for 30 seconds, okay? At least 30 seconds. So what we're looking for is you can try both sides to see, but um, usually one side you'll find some compensation where your hip's going to drop, your back's going to get sore, your radiating pain symptoms are going to come back, right? So what we're doing is if we have some weakness, it's going to be putting more compression on one of those spots that are pinching on the nerve, okay? So try the 30-second stand test. Number four, spondylolisthesis. So it's actually in this one, there's a, there's a bony defect in what's called the pars articularis. So this is where uh, the body of your vertebra meets the spinal process. So again, most commonly affects the fourth and fifth vertebrae, and everybody's probably wondering, Brayden, why is it always the fourth and the fifth? And it has to do with the anatomy and just the alignment of the spine. There's a lot more loading, a lot more force that happens. And the, actually, the, the canal that the nerve root comes out is actually smaller compared to the nerve size. It's a big nerve that comes through there. So that's, if you're wondering that why it's always affected that area, that's why. Um, so yeah, again, common symptoms, low back pain, and then pain, you'll have pain with extension. So that'll actually make it feel worse. So with this one, you might notice even, you might even be able to see it in your front or the back, there might be a little bit of a step. So you actually might see a little bit of a step deformity. That's really common in this, it creates a lot of instability. Um, with this, you can have any symptoms from, you know, just a little bit of a degeneration. You can have a bit of a fracture or a full, or a, a full break. Um, symptoms usually get worse throughout the day. Your muscles have to work really hard to try to stabilize that area. If they can't do that, then you get pain. Um, so you'll usually see like a flatter back. We usually have this rounded curve. If you're, if you're not seeing that nice round curve, that lordosis, um, then you have a sign that your back's flat. Um, so with, with this condition, it's kind of the, one of the worst ones, I would say. If you have DDD, if you have disc injuries, if you have spinal stenosis, it can actually lead you down this road to this injury, okay? So that's something we want to try to avoid. And number five, the piriformis syndrome. So you have a big muscle in your buttock. It's called your piriformis. What can happen is it runs right over that nerve. Uh, it can spasm. It can become tight and swell. It can cause pain. Uh, it also can put pressure, right, onto that nerve and irritate it. So you might have pain walking upstairs or with prolonged sitting. A lot of times I hear when people are sitting or commuting to work, if they're sitting on that nerve for too long, their leg will go to sleep and they'll go out and walk out of their car and their legs will feel like jello. Um, so that's kind of a, a sign you can do with that. So true or false, if you have sciatica, you should stay in bed and rest. Yeah, you guys know this, false. Most patients do better if they stay active but they avoid excessive rest, okay? So you want to try to be as active as you, as you can, keep moving, but don't overdo it.
So consult your doctor or your registered physical therapist and get an accurate diagnosis and individualized treatment plan before commencing any new program. So I want to go into the exercise stuff that you guys all are here for. You know you told me that before. Um, I want to show you a few of my favorite exercises for each of these conditions that you can try. Um, so you can try them if things seem to get better and it's working its way out of the leg. So coming up into the back more, that's a good sign. We call that centralization. That means it's getting better. If it's going back down the leg and uh, it goes down into the foot, getting distal, that means it's getting worse. You're probably not doing the right exercise. So if you have questions, okay. So for this degenerative disease, DDD, the first one I want to show you is a knee hug. So what you want to do is lie on your back. You want to keep one leg straight and then you're going to bend the other one up. Give it a nice big hug until you start to feel a little bit of rounding in your low back. So you can do that, hold it for 30 seconds. You can do it multiple times. Okay. The second one, I call it a cat camel or a cat cow. And what you want to do is you want to go on all fours and you want to induce some spinal extension. So arching your back like a cat, looking up to the ceiling. And then the other one you want to arch that as if you're getting up like a sleepy cat and you can work your way through that feeling things loosen up as you go and then the third one creates some spinal stability what you want to do it's called the bird dog so think about those hunter dogs you guys might have seen in some of our other workshops go check them out on low back pain i like this one a lot so what you want to do is try to think about you have a glass of water on your back some of my patients will know i tend to do this sometimes I tell them, don't let that glass spill. So keeping everything nice and flat, while you point out, keeping everything in your core nice and tight. If you guys want to go look at how to activate your core, go check out our last workshop on Restore Your Core. Uh, these next ones are for disc herniation. So remember with disc herniation, we said we like to go into extension, okay? So my favorite is called a prone press-up, or you yogis might know it as a prone cobra. So what you want to do, is lie on your stomach. The key with this one is not letting your back muscles do the work, it's passive. You wanna use your arms to do the work, okay? So what you wanna do is just push up through your arms, create some spinal extension. You can hang out here for a couple minutes, feel free to do that. You can also work up and down doing reps. And it's not necessarily about how much extension you create, as much as that you are doing the extension and you're not using your back muscles, everything stays soft here, okay? exercise I want to show you. We did a diagnostic test for the slump test. So you can turn that into a treatment as well. So we can do a sciatic nerve floss. So what I want you guys to do again is just slump over. And when you do this, bring your foot up to you. So I want you to think about your head and your foot are going to move in the same direction. Okay. So think about like flossing your teeth. So what I want you to do is point your toe or your chin comes down and then your toe pull it up towards you. As your head comes up and i wouldn't do more than 10 at a time with these guys just start with 10 and see how it goes sometimes it can be pretty irritable so just try that to start and then you can progress and do more after if it's okay and then for spinal stenosis remember we said flexion is good extension is bad so one of my favorite exercises i call them knee hugs so you can do one you can do both but what you want to do is create that spinal flexion. And the way you do that is by hugging both these to your chest. Again, you can hang out here. You can do it for reps. Just opening up that spinal canal and getting some pressure off of that nerve, okay? I included cycling in here for you guys. Um, it's really good. Um, people that want to keep moving, keep their uh, cardiovascular exercise going. It doesn't it necessarily... You know, it's going to actually speed up your healing to create that cardiovascular exercise. But cycling is actually a really good thing to do if walking bothers you because it puts you back into that flexed position already. So it actually feels pretty good for most people when they have some sort of stenosis, okay? And then the other two I just included um, is a plank. So working on some core stability, right? Not letting you go into that extended position, being able to support yourself that way. So you can start on your knees. Try it that way, that's easier. Or you can go all the way off your feet, making sure you're in line. And the big thing, guys, don't 
let your back fall into extension or else you're going to get more sore, okay? That's the key of that one. I'm sure everybody's seen a plank, their favorite, right? And then for a spondylolisthesis, um, it's very important with this one to, you know, we don't have that structure of the spine to support you, right? So where do we get our support from? We use our muscle structure, right? Our core, our inner unit, our outer unit. Go ahead and check out our previous workshop on Restore Your Core. Um, and you can see some of the core techniques there. I really suggest that was a good one. Um, but I'll show you real quick a couple different ones you can try. You can try the multifidus. You can try the transverse abdominis one. So basically, what you want to do with the TA is you want to be crook line on your back. It's the easiest position. What you want to think about is your belly button has a string and it's attached to your spine, okay? So you want to try to pull your belly button in towards your spine, or you can also think about it as like your rib cage and your pelvis, trying to do a little crunch, okay? So you're not actually crunching up, but you're trying to crunch together here, okay? So I want you to try and activate your TA that way, so you can practice that, okay? The other way to get your multifidus, so the multifidus is back here, I want you to think about like wagging your tail like a dog, okay? Activate your multifidus and then try to push your back into the table and like make it flat. Try to think about breaking, breaking uh, bread behind your back, okay? So try to add those two together. Do 10 deep breaths and see if you can do that, okay? The other way to activate your multifidus if you're having trouble is pretend that you are at the edge of a cliff, okay? And you're going to peer over this edge of the cliff and you're really high up and you want to go onto your toes and what you can do is put your hands behind your back to feel your muscles engage back there. If you can feel them, then you're engaging multifidus, okay? Another little trick you can do. And then finally, for the piriformis syndrome, essentially what happens is that piriformis gets too tight or they get some swelling and it's putting that pressure on that nerve. So what we want to do is stretch it out to relieve some of that tension. So what you can do, there's a couple. My favorite is just stretching the piriformis. You want to put your foot on like you're reading a newspaper. You can push it down. You can put your foot up on a couch or a table or a chair. You can also pull it up this way if you feel like. So you want to feel it right in the butt, okay? If you don't get with, uh, that much from that one, if you're very flexible, you might have to even internally rotate your hip and pull it across your body. Kind of rotate there until you feel it into the buttock, okay? The other way to do it is using a foam roller, if you're not familiar with. I'm sure many of you have tried that before, but um, you can roll it out. Just be gentle on it. Sometimes if you press on it too hard, it might make it worse. So just play around with that a little bit. And then using a clamshell to strengthen your glutes to relieve some of that tension, putting on pressure on the nerve. Okay. So what's your biggest takeaway from the workshop today? So let's chat. I want to know. Type in the chat box what you've learned or what you may do differently with the information you now have. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, the live giveaway. So Michelle, I couldn't do it without her. She's amazing. She's the behind the scenes. I, I couldn't do these workshops without her. She's going to put all the names of who attended on the wheel of names. So I'll invite her to share her screen with all of us and spin the wheel who sees. You can try that with the piriformis exercise. I'll show you. Who gets to win the foam roller? Who doesn't want to win a foam roller, guys? You can try it out. $50 value. You can have this nice foam roller. So our next steps. Uh, we're going to, in a second, answer some of those burning questions that you might have. Um, but if you feel like the question is just specific to you, or you're wondering if physio would be appropriate for what you're dealing with, just type sciatica in the chat box, and I'll follow up with you directly. Uh, we can do a 15-minute phone conversation, just kind of get an idea of what you need to be doing. If you've heard enough today and you want to know, and you know that physio is something you want to try, you can call or book online with me or any of the other physios at either Sterling or our 26th Street location. And then watch your emails over the weekend for the links to the video recording of today's workshop and to get the free exercise PDF. So all those exercises we went through, you guys are going to copy that. You can try that out. And also, please be sure, you know, help us out, guys. Take, take, um, 
just take a second. It doesn't take long. Fill out the post workshop survey. That's going to be in the email. Really helps us improve. You know what um, to make our workshops better. I really want to find out what you guys want to see. What do you want to see for future topics? Um, that way, I can help you guys out as well. And then, speaking of future topics, keep your eyes open for our next upcoming workshop in November. It's going to be on neck pain, so it's going to be a good one. Keep your eyes out for that, okay, guys. So now let's open it up for some of your burning questions. Okay, so I got one question in the chat. Is the SI joint same as sciatica? So I would say no. The SI joint is in the pelvis. It's kind of in the buttock, in the back. The joint is like any other joint. It's like your shoulder, your knee, your hip. There's some movement. Um, a lot of times with sciatica, it can be compounded by this SI joint. Remember how I said that L5S1 right down low in your back? There can be a nerve root that comes out of there. So there can be potentially some issue with this, but sciatica, uh, different than the SI joint itself, but there can be some overlap with that SI and sciatica for sure. Okay, next question. Is it possible that my sciatica, which was on the right side, can migrate to the left? 100% Susan. We'll, we'll think back maybe a little bit into... Um, usually with true sciatica, it is only on one side, but remember the one condition that we talked about, spinal stenosis. So if it's a central canal, it can put pressure on the spinal canal and it can go either side. This isn't uncommon with central canal stenosis. So yes, this can happen. So look at some of those spinal stenosis exercises for your stability. Okay. Should a person get an MRI? I think I talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, an MRI is not, you know, unless there's some severe case, um, you know, an MRI isn't necessarily, you know, isn't, shouldn't be necessary, right? Um, I would consider an MRI only after, you know, we've tried some physio for our timeline, like what we talked about, that four to eight weeks or that one to four months after that even. So um, then if nothing's getting better, then that's probably time we talk with your doctor and we can kind of do something else to see what's happening in there. Um, but for the most part, as a physio, we don't necessarily need an MRI to diagnose you or tell you where it's coming from, but it can help, right? It's just the, another tool that we use to, to help us paint a picture for you guys. Um, would a bursitis present like sciatica? It can, yeah, it, it can kind of feel like that. So depending on, you know, which bursa, a bursa, if you guys don't know, is a, a fluid filled sac. It's like a, it's kind of like a ball bearing. If you mechanical people know what the ball bearing is, C creates um, less friction, right? So depending on where the ball bearing is, I think probably you're talking about the hip bursitis. That's usually the most common and it kind of underlaps, uh, it goes underneath the glute tendons. Um, the difference with this is it would be more lateral hip pain. So it wouldn't be so much in the buttock. With, you know, with sciatica, it's, it's likely to go down further than just the butt, right? True sciatica. It'll go into the leg itself. Um, so if it's a bursitis, likely it's more just on the outside of your hip, okay? Um, so that would be the kind of common difference. And likely a bursitis will get worse with exercise, worse with walking, worse with things that it's more of an overuse kind of injury, okay? And then can you have sciatica without any pain at all? 100%. Yeah, remember how we talked about some of those people with, uh, with disc bulges? They don't even know it's happening and they're just getting um, weakness or tingling in their foot, right? So it just has to do, um, sciatica depends which nerve root's getting impinged, right? So some of, the, some of the tunnels, some of the nerves that come out of there for sensation, so they can sense things. Others are for motor, so for muscles. And then others are for pain. So sometimes I see people, they don't even know. They have just extreme weakness, but they're like, Graydon, I'm fine. I have no pain. I'm like, yeah, but your legs are giving out on you. I don't want you to fall, right? But yeah, true. It can come without any pain at all. Just depends where it's getting compressed, okay? So uh, without any more questions, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. Um, I always appreciate you guys coming and, and learning and supporting and I hope everybody took something out of this workshop. Um, so I hope to see you at the next workshop in November and hopefully get to see some new faces in the clinic. So um, I look forward to meeting you all and uh, I'll see you in November.